بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ولا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to our history of Islam class Today is the introduction to this class This is the first session of the history of Islam class and we will start from the beginning of Islam and that's why the subject is the history of Islam instead of the seerah because we believe that the Prophet ﷺ did not bring something new he continued what other messengers came with so basically when does Islam start when does the history of Islam start and why does it start from the messenger وسلم, from the prophethood from his birth when does it start basically anyone has an answer from Nuh so before Nuh there was no Islam Adam السلام, was not Muslim it starts from Adam السلام. so basically Islam starts from day one of humanity Islam starts from the time of Adam السلام. actually that's why many scholars like Ibn Kathir rahimahullah, in his book the book of history al Bidayah and Nihayah he did not start from the prophethood of Muhammad وسلم, but rather he started from the creation of Adam السلام. Because he was the first Muslim. When we say Islam is submission, means Adam alayhi salam is the first one who submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the first Muslim. So that's when the history of Islam starts. But the Prophet وسلم, he perfected this message. By sending Muhammad وسلم, Islam was perfected. But before that, all the messengers are brothers. All of them conveyed the same message, which is the message, message of Islam. We mentioned that many subjects in religion, they overlap. And this is true about the seerah, the history of Islam, and the hadith. Because in seerah, we deal with the traditions of the Prophet Wasallam, And in the hadith also, we deal with the traditions of the Prophet Wasallam. However, in the seerah, we don't verify much like what we do in the hadith. Because basically, we are dealing with historical incidents. Where in seerah, we also focus on the life of the Prophet ﷺ. But in the hadith, we focus on the traditions of the Messenger ﷺ. And in seerah, you will find more narrations and more historical incidents about the era before Islam, and after the Messenger وسلم, the Khulafa, all this is included in the seerah of the Prophet In this subject, we'll try to combine between the books of history which are written about Islam, as I said, like Al-Bidayah and Nihaya, Tarikh Al-Umam wal Muluk for Ibn Jarir Al-Tabari, both of them, I believe, they are translated to English, and the other books of Sirah, because usually when we say book of Sirah, it starts with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So we will take before we move to the Sirah of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, we will take a few sessions about the history before that, and we will start from Adam alaihi salam. We believe that Adam alaihi salam is the first human, and we don't believe in the evolution theory or the Darwinism. We don't believe in that, even scientifically until now they say it's a theory. So we don't even need to spend much time refuting this false thing. Because in Islam we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam and Adam was the first human being. Human beings did not come from the apes, they did not evolve. They are as they are from day one, from the creation of Adam alayhi salam. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran. When he created Adam, he is the first human being, he is the first Muslim. And we will discuss this, insha'Allah, further in the tafsir, when we take the story of Adam alayhi salam. Now, why do we study seerah? Isn't it enough to study the hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam? So why do we study the seerah? In the subject of the hadith, we study the traditions of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So why do we study seerah then? Studying the seerah, will allow the Muslims to follow the Messenger 
Yes, studying hadith is important, but it's not enough. You need to know how this happened. What's the reason be beyond what happened? What's the reason behind it? So, studying the seerah will allow you to follow the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And by studying the seerah, you achieve the love to Allah subhanahu wa taala, which will not happen if you do not follow the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Ask any person who idolizes any celebrity. They try to find all the information about them because they love them. So when we say we love the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, what is the evidence for that? What's the proof of our love to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? By studying the seerah, we will be able to love Allah subhanahu wa taala through the love of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Also, it helps us in lots of Islamic rulings. Now, in hadith, they may mention the narration, but what's the story? What's the reason? What happened before that? That's what we have in Sira. The beauty about the Sira, you you start from the beginning, whether from the birth of Muhammad sallallahu or from the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu While in Hadith you have only narrations, they are not in order. Which narration came first? In Sira you take the incidents in order, the history in order. What happened first? What happened next? So that will help you knowing better the Islamic rulings. Also studying the seerah will help us to know which came later. So which abrogated, which hadith is abrogated and what's the abrogator, what came next. This will help us remove the contradiction that we may find in some of the hadith, in some of the incidents. We gave an example about the jihad. There are many other examples that we will find out, inshallah, once we read and we move forward in, the, in studying the seerah and the hadith. Also, by studying the seerah, we take advantage and we learn the lessons. Now, many times we face some difficulties and we complain. And we think that this is very, very difficult time. Some people even say it's more difficult than the time of the companions or the messengers, sallallahu alayhi wa once we study the seerah, we will know for sure that we cannot compare our time to the time of the Messenger It's never close to what they went through. They had to deal with lots of difficulties. How we will know that? By studying the seerah. After we study and we compare, we'll find out that they went through many difficulties. We cannot compare ourselves to them. And therefore, it will give us steadfastness. We will be more appreciative to what we have and it will motivate us to work more and more. Also, we understand the wisdom behind some rulings. Now, when we read the story of Aisha radiallahu anha, when she lost her necklace, and upon that story, the ayah was revealed about the tayammum. The permission was given to perform tayammum. But what happened before that? Muslims were delayed, the entire army, they did not have water. Where do you find this? You find part of it in the hadith, and the major part you find it in the seerah. You study the seerah, you study the campaigns and the battles of the Messenger, وسلم, and you find it there. So studying the seerah will allow you to understand the wisdom to some extent behind some rulings. Where do we find topics of this subject? Where do we go to read the seerah? Of course, we have the books of seerah, but that's all. First, we have the Quran. As I said, the Quran has many incidents about the seerah. So the first source for this subject is the Quran. And the second source is the book of Hadith. Now many times we have the ahadith, the narrations of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it will let us know about some incidents. But the problem, the only problem in the hadith that they are not in order. When you study the seerah, you study the historical time from year one, year two and up. While in the hadith you have the narration. But still, the book of hadith 
like the chapter in Sahih al-Bukhari, in Sahih Muslim, all books of hadith, they included the seerah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa So the books of hadith are a source for this subject. Another source for this subject is the miracles and the qualities of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa We have some books talked about the miracles of the Prophet sallallahu what he was given, the Qur'an, splitting the moon, the water coming from his fingers. Now when you read this miracle, you read behind it the seerah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa So it is another source of the seerah. Another source is the merits, the books of the merits of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa We have several books. I have here one called Al-Shama'il al muhammadiyah for Imam Al-Tirmidhi. He combined the ahadith about the qualities and the merits of the Prophet sallallahu This is the book. It is called Mukhtasar. This is the, the summarized one. Mukhtasar al-Shama'il al muhammadiyah for Imam Al-Tirmidhi. All what you have here is a hadith, but also it is a great source for the seerah as well. And of course, we have the books of seerah. So we have many sources. Do not think that you don't find the seerah except in the books of seerah, like Sirat ibn Kathir, Sirat ibn Hisham. No, there are other books as well. The exclusive books that are written about the seerah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we have the seerah of Ibn Kathir. In Arabic, it's in four volumes, and in English, we have it in two volumes. This is the book, The Life of the Prophet Wasallam. This is the second volume. We have the first volume as well. This is one of the books of seerah. And we have the summarized one. It's called Al-Fusul. I don't think it's available in English, but we have it in Arabic. Al-Fusul fi Sirat Rasul. And I have it here actually. It's right there. I will not go. It's in, in red color. This is the book. It's also about the Sirah. Al-Fusul fi Sirat Rasul. It's one volume. Ibn Kathir rahimahullah summarized and briefed what he wrote in four volumes. We have. Another book which is great, it's written in English, Sirat al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wal mustashriqeen and the Orientalists. This book is printed in the King Fahd complex in Medina, the same place where they print the Quran. This book is very good because it talks especially about the suspicions of the Orientalists. And of course, we have the sealed nectar, Rahiq al Maktoum, for Sheikh Safi Rahman Mubarak Furi. And we have the smaller one, when the moon split. And we have them both, and you're supposed to have them both, or at least one of them. Both of them, I believe, they are printed in Dar es Salaam. This is one of them. And this is the book that we will study, inshallah, when the moon split. Actually, alhamdulillah, we have many books. We have many books written about the Prophet wasallam, And this is the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we have many books written about the Messenger wasallam in English. However, unfortunately, most of these books, they don't relate to the non-Muslim people. They don't relate to the Western culture or the Western society. And I have a wish. I wish if one day an English speaker wrote, a Muslim wrote a book about the seerah of the Messenger وسلم, in a way that he relates to the non-Muslims. Nowadays, you go to any bookstore, Barnes and Nobles, Amazon, what's the best-selling book about the Messenger وسلم? Whether it's written by an Orientalist, which includes many things which are wrong, or a book written by a non-Muslim, which is still good, but he's not Muslim. Like the, the biography of the Prophet Wasallam, according to the early writers. This is one of the best-selling books. And alhamdulillah, at least it is a good book. 
about the Messenger وسلم. So we need, since we live here in a Western society, we need to produce something suitable. It doesn't have to start from year one or from the birth of the Prophet وسلم. What many people did, they came to this book, it's written in Arabic and they translated it to English. That's good, alhamdulillah, but it's not enough. It's not enough. Everybody has to love the Prophet وسلم. If people knew the reality of the personality of the Messenger وسلم, most of them, they would believe in him. But I believe we did not do our job correctly. The Orientalists, the people who have hostility, they did their job. And we blame them. You don't blame someone for doing his job. If he's your enemy, that's what you should expect from him. But did you do your job? That's the question. How many books written by Muslims in a way that it relates to the Western culture? That's what we need to do. So inshallah, hopefully, some of the Arab students will do this soon, inshallah. Remember how many books do we have? It's best-selling book. The ex-president of the United States, he wrote his life in a book, and it's best-selling. Many celebrities, they wrote, they wrote books, and it's selling. So why don't we write something? We say we love the Prophet wasallam. How do we reflect this in writing? You will get the money, inshallah, so you will get a worldly benefit, and you will get the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine if you came in the Day of Judgment with a book written about the Prophet ﷺ. Maybe you cannot write a book, a CD. Alhamdulillah, a nice CD was released. And there are many CDs, but you need something focused to the non-Muslims. Alhamdulillah, for the Muslims, we have many books. I could list to you at least 10 books, but to the non-Muslims. This is one of the best-selling books. And look what it has in the introduction. And so I believe today that my conduct is in accordance with the will of Almighty Creator. In standing guard against the Jew, I am defending the handiwork of the Lord. The writer of this book sold more than 5 million copies. Do you know who's the writer? Now it's clear, anti-Semitism, but it was selling. He's Hitler, Adolf Hitler. He wrote this book, and it, with lots of hostility, this is the introduction of this book. He's telling him, he's telling everybody that the Lord commanded me to kill the Jews. Now the Prophet ﷺ never did that, yet we don't have a best-selling book about the Messenger ﷺ. This is just a simple reminder for myself and for you, that we take responsibility by following the Prophet ﷺ to defend him. The companions, they did not allow anything to be said against the Messenger wasallam. So what have we done? We have to respond. We have to answer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger on the Day of Judgment. But before we do that, at least we have to improve ourselves. We have to follow the Prophet wasallam. We have ourselves to know more about the Sunnah of the Messenger Wasallam. Nowadays, if you ask many people, many Muslims, what do they know about the Sunnah of the Messenger Wasallam? They don't know that much. Maybe if you ask them about astros or rockets, they know the names of the players and they know the people more than they know the seerah of the Messenger Wasallam. This is just a reminder. I don't know if you know this answer or not. How many children did the Prophet ﷺ have? Louder? Six. Do you agree? Six? Yes. He actually had four. Seven. Six or seven. So we don't have even a definite answer. <laughs> Who are they? Who are the children of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Children from Khadija. From Khadija. Um Kulthum. Um Kulthum. Fatima. Ruqayya. Um, and. Uh, Ibrahim. 
Ibrahim is not from Khadija. Ibrahim from Maria. It's correct. He had four daughters from Khadija. Didn't he have any male children from Khadija? Al Qasim. That's it. So if Al Qasim with the four daughters, how many? Five. With Ibrahim, six. Scholars agreed on six. They differed if there is another one. Many scholars said he had two. Two boys from Khadija radiallahu anha. They died. So the total is seven or six. But when you say four or three or you don't even know or you have a wrong answer because once I asked this question and they said Al-Hassan wal Hussein. <laughs> yeah, we laugh but we should cry because it's tragedy when you don't know the names of the children of the Prophet Yes, you had something, Shahada? Tahir. Yeah, Tahir, he's from uh, Khadija, but some said it's the title of Al Qasim, Al Tayyib and Al Tahir. How many uncles did the Prophet ﷺ have in his lifetime? After Islam. After he received the revelation. How many uncles did he have? Four, five. Any other answer? Yes? Ayan says three. Ayan says three. MashaAllah, we have three answers now. Three, four, five. Who are they? Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab. Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan. Abu Jahal. Abu Jahal. Abu, Abu Talib. Abu Talib. Hamza. Hamza. The, these are five. What about Al Abbas? Al so they are six? No. no. Wrong. Abu Jahl is not his uncle. Abu Jahl is not. Abu Lahab and Abu Talib, they are disbelievers. And we have Al Abbas and Hamza, they are believers. Abu Sufyan is not the uncle of the Messenger. Four. Four. But the total uncles of the Messenger. I thought his father was a Exactly, his father was the tenth. So how many uncles did he have? Nine. But when he was he received the revelation, there were only four. So only two became Muslims? Yes, two Muslims and two non-Muslims. So again, these should be basic information, which we should know. So that tells you we need to work on ourselves a lot. So we'll start with Adam alayhi salam. Adam is the first Muslim. And there is no time to discuss all the details. We will mention only a few things. Like how he was created, Adam alayhi salam. From clay. Because we have this in the Quran. خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ صَلْصَالٍ كَالْفَخَّارِ وَخَلَقَ الْجَانَّ مِنْ مَارِجٍ مِنْ نَارِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam himself with his hand. So Adam was the first human being. Then comes Hawa, Eve. It was created, she was created from Adam alayhi salam. How long did Adam alayhi salam live? Do you know? Thousand years. Thousand years? Do you have an evidence? Yes, he gave 40 years to whom? Dawood. Dawood. So he lived for 960 years, and when the angel of death came, he said, I have 40 more years left. And he was told, you already gave them to Dawood, and he refused. So he was given the 40 years. So he lived for 1,000 years. There are some narrations. 70 feet. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, actually the, the, there are many narrations about the Prophet, from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the, the creation when it began, they were tall. And then it declined. Yeah, like the grave of Habil, the second son of Adam Alayhi Salaam, 
they say it is in Syria. I saw I saw it, but there is no authentic narration says it is there, and it's it's like longer than this room. So Allahu alam. But it's true there are narrations from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi and actually there is authentic narration that even on the day of judgment, the people will be returned to their original creation, seventy feet, thirty three years age. So the age will be thirty three and. The length will be 70 feet. So that's the height of Adam alayhi salam. Then we will move quickly to Nuh alayhi salam. Was there any prophet between Adam and Nuh? Was there any prophet? No? Yes, there was. Prophets, but not messengers. Nuh alayhi salam was the first messenger. Nuh alayhi salam was the first messenger. But there were prophets like Idris. Idris came before Nuh. Some say he came after, but definitely there were few prophets between Adam and Nuh. How long was, how many years were between Adam and Nuh? Ten generations. Ten generations, exactly. That's what came in Sahih al-Bukhari. So these information, you need to know them. There are ten generations between Adam and Nuh. And this hadith will come with us, inshallah, in the Aqidah. How long did Nuh alayhi salam live? 900 years. 900. 900. Yes. Arshia says 900 and Omar says 950. Arshia says 900 and Omar says 950. Well, Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al Ankabut, Nuhan ila fa sanatin illa khamsina ama. We sent Nuh to his people, so he remained with them 950 years. Basically, Allah says 1,000 except 1,000 but 50, so 950 years. Scholars said this is the, the period of his prophethood. 950 years was the period of his prophethood, which means he lived before that. So it could be 50 years. Allahu alam, but definitely it's more than 950 or 950, not less than that. Because Allah says, He remained with them 950 years. And again, this is mentioned in the Quran. So when you read the Quran, remember these, these things, what you are reading. What was His miracle? What was His miracle? The flood? The flood was the miracle or the ship of Nuh salam, the boat. Yes, that was his miracle. And it was said that they found it on the top of a mountain in Turkey. But Allahu Alam, if it's, if it's true or not. What do we learn from his story? From the story of Nuh salam. Now, did many people believe in him or few people? Very few. Although he, he was with them for how long? 950 years. And we have some people, after one year they complain. Or after even one time. And they complain. I, I invited some people to Islam and they refused. Well, what do you expect? That's your job. Your job starts when they reject. Guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you do your job. After 950 years, you can complain. Before that, do not complain. Very few people believed. So you learn that guidance is not from you. It is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even though he, he lasted for 950 years, one of his sons, he did not believe. He asked him to come with him and he refused. And Allah told him, إِنَّهُ لَيْسَ مِنْ أَهْلِكِ He is not from your family. He disobeyed him once. And he was not from his family. Scholars say, so what, what about the people who disobey their parents? Time after time and after time. Nuh salam, his son disobeyed him once and that's what happened to him. Anyway, we will move to Ibrahim alayhi salam, the friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as Allah says, وَاتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ خَلِيلًا And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took Ibrahim as a friend. His life was amazing. The life of Ibrahim alayhi salam, it was amazing. Because at his time, he was the only believer, he and his wife. He and his wife. What was the miracle of Ibrahim alayhi salam? The, 
fire. That stone, the flying stone, whatever, when you put, when you, um, when you put in Mecca, where you close When he built Mecca, we will come to the details later on when we talk about Mecca, but basically when he was thrown into the fire, it did not harm him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, قُلْنَا يَا نَارُ كُونِي بَرْدًا وَسَلَامًا He had Ibrahim alayhi salam, as Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah says, he's the first one to, to exercise the art of debate with the non-Muslims, with the disbelievers. He had lots of debates with his people, with his father, as it's mentioned in Surah Taha, with his people in many places in Surah Shu'ara, in Surah Al-Furqan, in Surah Al-An'am, with the king Namrud, in Surah Al-Baqarah. So he had many debates. He had to go through lots of trials. And that's basically why he deserved to be the friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot, as they say, no pain, no gain. Things are not acquired easily. You have to pay the price for them. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, he had to go through lots of things. And he is the first one to migrate in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَقَالَ إِنِّي ذَاهِبٌ إِلَىٰ رَبِّي سَيَهْدِينَ So he's the first one to legislate the migration for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He left his people, he left his relatives, he left his own country for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they were disbelievers. There are many lessons in the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam. His children, who are they? Ismail and Ishaq. Ismail and Ishaq. Although he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for one, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him two. So you learn to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is able to give you more than what you deserve or more than what you ask for. So learn to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always and He will give you. All of them, both of them, Ishaq and Ismail were prophets. And from there, Progeny also, prophets and messengers came. Nowadays, Christians and Jews, they say we follow the Abrahamic faith. But do they really follow it or we are the true followers? This is another thing. Ibrahim salam called for one message. His message was Tawheed, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you claim that you're following the Abrahamic faith, where is the Abrahamic faith? And they say Abrahamic faith... Actually, it's one faith. It's not faith. It's faith. Because it's the faith of Tawheed. So whether they are Jews or Christians, what do they know about Ibrahim alayhi salam? We sacrifice because we follow Ibrahim alayhi salam. It's the sunnah of Ibrahim alayhi salam. When he was commanded to sacrifice his son. We perform hajj because Ibrahim alayhi salam is the one who started calling for hajj. So what, what do they say? when? What do they know about Ibrahim alayhi salam? You need to use these things when you talk about Ibrahim, especially to non-Muslims. Who is the messenger who was a relative to Ibrahim alayhi hmm? salam? Lut. Exactly. Lut alayhi salam was a relative to Ibrahim alayhi salam. قَالَ إِنَّ فِيهَا لُوطَ قَالُوا نَحْنُ عَلَمُوا بِمَنْ فِيهَا And of course, the Qur'an related to us many messengers. Are all the messengers and prophets mentioned in the Qur'an? No? What's the evidence? There is a hadith of the prophet, but there is... There is a hadith of the prophet? Yeah, that says that there is many messengers who came... Um, I, don't, I don't remember the hadith. It's an ayah actually. مِنْهُمْ مَنْ قَصَصْنَا عَلَيْكَ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ لَمْ نَقْصُصْ عَلَيْكَ of the messengers, those which we related to you, their stories, and those which we did not relate to you, their stories. So not all the messengers, their stories are mentioned in the Qur'an. We have a few are mentioned in the Qur'an, but there are many that are not mentioned in the Qur'an. Your job, you have an assignment, your homework is to list all the messengers and prophets that are mentioned in the Qur'an. Where do you find this? In the book of Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, Stories of the Prophets. With this, we will conclude our session.